Well, church, it's good to be with you on this 4th of July Sunday. I want to say welcome to everyone who's watching at home on our live stream as well. Well, as Nate said, we're launching this new teaching series, Summer Book Club, because we want you to be a thinking, reading Christian. And everybody needs a good summer read, right? And, so, and there's so many brilliant Christian authors, godly women and men who write on subjects on everything from your spirituality to family to business to mental health. And so we're going to be covering some of those, some of our pastor's favorite new releases. We're going to be looking at some of those this, this, uh, this July. The first one, my choice, is Business Made Simple by Don Miller. And by the way, we have multiple copies in the lobby if you want to take one home with you or if you're watching online, just order off, on, off Amazon. But Don Miller, if you don't know much about Don Miller, he's been one of my favorite authors over the last dozen years or so. My first book of his I read was Blue Like Jazz. Blue Like Jazz changed who I was as a pastor, as a leader spiritually. It's a powerful book. You have to have it in your library. Another great read of Don Miller's is A Million Miles in a Thousand Years. That's a game changer. Another one is Story Brand. You need that. But today we're looking at Business Made Simple. And in Business Made Simple... Uh, Miller opens up by talking about the need for character. Because in business and in life, maybe character matters more than anything else. It doesn't matter how much ability or talent you have. It doesn't matter how much education or or experience you have. If you fail to have character, if you don't have character, you will fail at everything you do in business and in life. And so he starts by talking about a number of successful people who he interviewed. And and so I'll start with a question. Have you ever thought about what's the difference between successful people in life and business and unsuccessful business and uh, and unsuccessful people and businesses? And he starts to look for the uncommon character traits and the ones who are successful. And so he ends up interviewing heads of state. He interviews uh, Fortune 500 CEOs. He interviews university presidents. Uh, athletes, professional athletes, professional coaches, social justice heroes. And then he puts together this list of uncharacteristics, uncommon traits of, uh, of, of Christ-driven leaders. He uses the language uh, values-driven professional. I'm going to use the language today, Christ-driven leaders. So what's our first value? Our first value is this, is that Christ-driven leaders uh, view themselves as a valuable asset. And I don't know if you've ever thought about yourself as being a valuable asset, but if you have a job, if someone is paying you, if you're getting a paycheck, then someone somewhere considered you a valuable asset. All right, so our text today is going to be from Matthew 25. Uh, In Matthew 25, Jesus tells a story, a parable about valuable assets and and, uh, invaluable, unvaluable assets. All right, we're going to start in verse 14. The kingdom of heaven is also like a man going off on an extended trip. He called his servants together and delegated responsibilities. To one, he gave $5,000. This is from the Message Bible, by the way, if you're reading along. To another one, he gave $2,000, depending, and to one, $1,000, depending on their abilities. Then he left, and right off the first servant went to work and doubled the master's investment. The second one did the same. But the man with the, th- with the single thousand dug a hole and carefully buried his master's money in the ground. So we have the first two employees or servants, as they're referred to here, as uh, the first two we see are valuable assets. They see that they bring value to what they're their boss is doing. The third one sees himself as a useless asset. He does not see that he's a valuable asset. Uh, Miller coins a phrase in Business Made Simply, coins a phrase, value-driven professionals. And he says that as an employee or as someone managing or someone owning a business, you need to see yourself as someone who brings value to your customer, someone who brings value to your university, to your school, to your college, value to your family, value to your organization. You are a valuable asset. I want to say especially as a daughter or a son of the king of kings, you're born with this innate value and worth. And sometimes we miss it. 
And so the question is, do you see this value in your life and everything that you do? Do you see yourself as a valuable asset to your family or to your church, to your ministry? Do you see yourself as a valuable asset to your employer or to the, to the customers who you, who you serve? I think in life we tend to put our money, we invest in things that give a good return on our investment, things that are a valuable asset. For example, if you have money to invest right now, you would invest in what? Probably Apple or Amazon. You would not want to invest in Deutschcoin, would you? You have no idea where that's going to end up. We put our money, we put our resources into things that are valuable. We, we like it when our professional teams here in town, the Cardinals, the Suns, the Diamondbacks, when they invest in valuable players. For example, they spend tens of millions on do- of dollars on an athlete. We're like, yes, because we believe we'll see a return on that investment. We believe we'll win more games. Some question the Suns' decisions to, the, uh, decision to pay Chris Paul so much. Two nights ago, he proved he's a valuable asset. Can I just add to this, Suns and Four? All right, Suns and Four. Yes, thank you, thank you. A lot of believers this hour. You know, last, not so many believers last hour. It's going to happen. All right, we've got the team this year. But it's like that in all of life. In the same way companies invest in you. You know, a company has given you a job and they've hired you and they give you a salary because they believe you're a valuable asset. And that's not a bad thing. If you think about your job... People at work may really like you, all right? Maybe you tell jokes at the company barbecue and people love that. Or you play golf with the the boss or the company owner on the weekends and people really like you. But if you're honest, the only reason that they give, that they keep paying you is because you're a valuable asset. The, The reason that your company gives you a promotion or a pay raise is because you're a valuable asset. If you are not a valuable asset, then what else do you have to say? Well, I've been here five years. No, that's not going to get you a raise or a promotion. Value-driven leaders know that they are a valuable asset to their organization, and so they strive to be that. They, they, they see themselves as that. The servant with the five talents, he goes out and he doubles it because he knows he's a valuable asset. And so what does the owners do? The, we read in verse 24, he puts him in charge Of many things, it's the same with you. They say that the dream employee is an employee who gives their business, their organization, a five times return on the company's investment. That you need to be giving back a a five times ROI in whatever they're investing in you. So think about your job and are you giving a five times return on your investment? Then you're a a dream employee. I, I learned a valuable lesson about giving a return on your employment when I was still in college. One of the first jobs I had was to do phone sales for a company that sold business trinkets like keychains, bottle openers, pens. And so I would call the L.A. area trying to, to schedule meetings for the sales team, right? So I'd spend four hours. My shifts were four hours long, and i try to get six to 12 leads. And I had been working there the whole spring semester, my sophomore year, and uh, I, I make calls for four hours one day. I don't have one lead, and I felt terrible. I hear they're paying me good money, and, and I don't have one lead after four hours. So at the end of four hours, and by the way, this young woman named Veronica is one desk over, and she's like, bing, 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 lead after lead. They really liked her soft, sweet voice, something like that. And, but this dude, Palmer, couldn't get a lead. So I, at the end of my four hours, I walked into the owner's, there were two young owners, into the owner's office, and I said, hey, guys, I'm sorry. I just work for four hours. You're paying me good money, five twenty-five an hour. And I said, that's over $20. I said, I, don't pay me. I don't want your money, and I quit. <laughs> and they're like, no, stay, stay. So I'm like, no, I'm terrible. I'm not good at phone sales. So I walked out the door, and I was done. That was my last day because I was a terrible ROI, a terrible return on investment. I was not a valuable asset. About a month later, the church that I had been interning at in their high school, in their youth ministry, they offered me the position as their junior high pastor. And I'm only like 21 years old, but I'm excited about it. And on our church campus, we had a junior high school that met. There were just, it was a small junior high school. There were 21 junior hires. When I started as this new junior high pastor, there was only one kid from that little school coming to 
our, our youth group, even though they're on our campus. So I thought, well, this is low-hanging fruit. So every day after school, I'd go down to their campus, throw the football with them, play basketball, play soccer. Within about two months, I counted one Wednesday night how many of those kids from that school were at our, our Wednesday night youth group. All 21 of them were there. We had a winter camp that fall. All 21 signed up to go to camp. Here's the best part. We gave an invitation to receive Christ at the end of that winter camp, and all 21 of them prayed to receive Christ. Now, do you see, I felt I was giving my employer a return on their investment. I thought maybe this might be my calling to be a pastor, so I stuck with it. Phone sales, not so much. Some of you will shine. Some of you will do awesome. Not me. But do you see that in all of life, my encouragement is for you to see yourself as a valuable asset in whatever you do. Because when Jesus tells this parable about these three individuals, he wants all of us to see that in the kingdom of heaven on earth, you bring value. You are a person of value. You're made in the image of God. So whether it's in your family, in your neighborhood, among your friends, in your workplace, walk in there with your head up knowing that you're bringing kingdom value. All right? So that's our first uncommon characteristic of Christ-driven leaders. All right, so I'm going to go through a a short list here of uncommon characteristics and character traits of Christ-driven leaders. Our second one is this. Be a hero, not a victim. I, I think in all of our work lives, you can go through work as one of two characters. Your entire career, you can either be the hero or you can be the victim, right? There are some people that go through life as the victim. They, they're in your office right now. You know their names. Just don't shout them out in church. But you know who they are. And victims are blamers. They're always blaming someone else for their problems and their shortcomings and their underperformance. We have that guy in our story here. So go back with me to verse 24. Then the, the man who had received the one bag of gold came and he said, and master, he said, I knew that you were a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown, gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid and I went out and hid your gold in the ground. So what does this guy say? He's blaming his boss. He's saying, you're so successful, you're so good at what you do that I just shut down. You know, it's your fault that I shut down. Can I tell you this? People who are victims at work, they live frozen, don't they? They they don't take much action. They live like they're powerless, like they're victims of other people's decision. They're victims of circumstances. They'll blame the bad Wi-Fi. They'll blame the customer. But at the end of the day, they're usually victims and underperformers simply because they're lazy. In, in any story, so think about any great story or any great screenplay, any film, you always have the hero and the victim. Now, the victim is a necessary, but it's a very bit part. You really don't want to be the victim because the victim just usually gets hurt, wounded, beat up. But then you have the hero come in and save the victim. At the end of the film, at the end of the novel, the, the, the victim is hauled off in an ambulance, but the hero is standing there bloodied, clothes torn. People are praising him, giving him accolades. He's, he or she is famous now because they're the hero. So why would you ever want to go through life as a victim? But there's a lot of people that live like that. When you choose to start being the victim, when you choose to, to continually criticize your coworkers and blame them for your shortcomings, or you keep complaining about your, your boss and how they're holding you down, or you complain about the equipment that you have or the customers, nobody wants to be around you. People get tired of the victim that's in the office all the time. Here, here's what victims learn quickly. You get to play the victim once. And then people realize you've just played the victim so that I would do your job for you. Do you have those people at work? And they keep complaining and crying until someone else comes and does their work. And then they realize you are a false victim. And nobody cares to be around a false victim. Now, don't get me wrong here. There will be times in your life when you actually are a victim, someone treats you unfairly and justly, and so you cry out for help, and then people rally around you. But that's temporary. Then you have to rise back up and resume your role as hero. You're called as a son, as a daughter of the king of kings, to play the hero role, not the victim role. That's who you need to be. 
Miller says this. He says, I remember my biggest transformation happened when I realized that, gir- that girls wanted to be with the hero, not the victim. So I lost 150 pounds. That's what he said. And so now, and then after that, if you continue with his story, he, he found a girl and he got married and they're having a baby this month. So that's, that's Miller's story. I, I learned the value of the hero early on when I started dating uh, this young woman, Veronica, who I mentioned earlier. We'd only been dating when I was a sophomore in college about uh, maybe two or three weeks, and we're having lunch in, at the Biola University cafeteria. And she says, hey, Palmer, I have, to, I have to go to work right now. But she said, my car is almost out of gas. Could you follow me to the gas station just in case I run out? It was only like a mile away, but I was like, yeah. So I jump in my car, and I'm following her. And the whole time I'm going, God, God let, her, let her run out of gas. Please let her run out of gas. <laughs> because it's true. I really wanted to be her knight in shining armor and rescue her. Unfortunately, she makes it to the gas station safely. But I thought, all right, l- let me try to save the day. So I go up to her window and I said, hey, let me put gas in your car. Let me buy the gas for you. She says, oh, please do that. Well, I pull out all $8 that I have and I empty my wallet. Put eight, as I get her past a quarter of a tank and she thanks me and she leaves. But I didn't know until months and months later, she said, Palmer, she said, that day you... You follow me to the gas station. She said, I only had change in my purse. She said, you were my hero that day. I w- Maybe that's why she married me, all right? All it took was $8, $8. Yeah, we're going to applaud that. It took something. <laughs> but we all have that choice every day to see yourself as someone who can be the hero or the victim in your work, in your family, in your friendships. The biggest difference between the hero and the victim is that the victim lies down and gives up when things get hard. The hero rises up to the challenge. If you know anyone who's been successful in business and life, in in your circle of people that you know, notice this. They never play the victim. Things will get really hard. They might get knocked down. They never stay down. They always rise to the challenge. And I'll end with this thought here on this point. Is that only you, nobody else, only you gets to decide what character you'll play. Only you gets to decide whether you'll be the hero or the victim. Not somebody else. That's your choice. So choose to be the hero, not the victim. All right. Here's a third uncommon character trait of Christ-driven leaders, it's this. Have a bias toward action. Have you noticed that people who do great in life, they have a bias toward action? All right, let's go back to our story. I'm going to pick up at verse 19. After a long time, the master of those servants returned, settled accounts with them. The man who had received five bags of gold brought... uh, The other five, master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I've gained five more. Verse 21, the master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. Underline this in your Bible. I will put you in charge of many things. So, and then the same thing happens with the gentleman with the the two talents. So both of them have a bias toward action. We read that immediately, both of them. Put their funds to work. But what do we read toward about the third man? He has a bias toward inaction. He takes his talent or his gold or his thousand dollars and he buries it. This third man is catatonic. He does nothing at all. I don't know if you know these kinds of people, but over my life, my work life and ministry life, I've known some people who talk big about things. They love to sit around coffee shops and, and, and spend their days meeting with other people in coffee shops, and they just talk about ideas, and they never, ever do them. But I want to say people have a bias toward action. Make real things happen in this world. I think Christ-driven leaders like you have to be people who have a bias toward actions. You have to be a doer, someone who actually does things. What do I mean when I say have a bias toward action? It it means that you don't let a great idea, you don't let a big idea die on the vine. You start to take steps to make it happen. When I have an idea, I start to write, I write down the steps that I need to take. To have a bias toward action means that you schedule the meeting. It means you write the proposal. It, it, It means that 
you start to do the things each morning that will get it done. One of the most valuable lessons I learned from my own father, and I learned a lot from my dad, is that he had definitely a bias toward action. In fact, his life motto, you've heard me say, is faith in action, God in motion. But he had this bias toward taking action. I watched him when he wanted to start a college. I was in junior high, and I watched the whole thing. I was right with him every, every day it happened. The first thing he did was acquire land. He acquired land even though he had no money to build buildings on the land. The next thing he did was schedule a meeting with the president of the country because he needed accreditation. Most people would have maybe scheduled a meeting with the minister of education. He went straight to the top. He scheduled the meeting. What's the minister going to say if the president says, give them accreditation? It's going to happen. And then I watched him do this. Not only did he raise money for 22 buildings to start the college, he built 22 buildings before he had one student registered for class. He just kept taking action and taking action. And now maybe it's the leading Christian universities, the three in Africa on the continent. Why? Because he had a bias toward action. Successful people, like I said, make things happen. Not because they're smarter than the rest of us. Not because they have a better education or they have more money. It's because every day they wake up and take action. And I want to remind you of this before we move on. That you can beat out anyone in the marketplace, in your field, if you simply get up every day and take action. So that's the challenge there. All right, here's a fourth Fourth, um, uncommon character trait of Christ-driven leaders is this. Choose clarity and stop acting confused. So what does this mean? So, so Don Miller writes that a few years ago he had an employee who was underperforming, who was difficult, and was not a good fit for the team. And he said this employee, he said he wasn't sure what to do with the employee. And so he called a friend of his and he says, hey, I've got this, this employee who's underperforming and they're a bad fit for the team and they have a lousy attitude. Then Don said, I said, I'm confused about what I should do next. And his friend, his wise godly friend on the phone said, Don, stop choosing to be confused. Do you get what he's saying? In other words, and Don said the light turned off for him. Don says, I knew he was right. I was choosing to be confused. I knew what I needed to do. I just didn't want to do it. So I was choosing to be confused. Uh, if we go back to our Matthew 25 text, we read this line that uh, I was afraid. And so I went out and I hid your gold in the ground. In other words, I didn't want, know what to do, so I buried it. The man knew what to do, but he chose confusion over clarity. So I want to encourage you right now, if you're facing a hard decision or when you do face a tough decision, stop acting confused and choose clarity. Most situations that we say we are confused about, they're not confusing at all. It's just that it will take some hard work or a hard decision on your part. And so we choose confusion. Uh, When was the last time, let me ask you this, when was the last time you watched and you knew a high-impact person who went around all the time saying, well, I'm confused, I don't know what to do? No, high-impact people take action. Now, what are the reasons that we choose to be confused? Because... Because it's honest, all it's true. I found myself when I read this this chapter that, yes, sometimes I choose to be confused. Why do we do that? One, we're people-pleasing. Maybe a second reason is fear. We're afraid. Or we people-please because we think our coworkers or someone will criticize us. The second reason is fear. A third reason is we're afraid we'll lose face. We try something new, something bold, something daring. And so we, we think we'll lose face if it doesn't work out. So we choose confusion. So my challenge to you is to ask yourself, okay, why am I choosing confusion? Is it because I've been people-pleasing? Is it because I'm afraid of the criticism or I might lose face? Is it because of fear? So name what it is that is keeping you confused and then deal with it. And ask yourself this. If you're an unbiased person on the outside of the situation looking in, what would that unbiased person with clarity, what would they do? Ask yourself that. Choose clarity and stop acting confused. All right, one last final uncommon character trait of a Christ-driven leader is to be relentlessly optimistic. Just keep your head up and be relentlessly optimistic. 
So Dallas Willard, this is from his book, Divine Conspiracy. He's a brilliant thinker and theologian. He writes, one of the remarkable changes brought about, brought about by Jesus and his people into the ancient world concerned the elevation of hope as a primary virtue. Hope was not well regarded by the Greco-Roman world. You see, the Greeks believed, keep your hopes down. That way when things don't work out, you won't be disappointed. But then Christ comes along and he says, get your hopes up. That you are a daughter, you are the son of a king of kings. And everything is possible with God on your side, so get your hopes up. Live relentlessly optimistic. I've watched people, I've watched people, it's very possible to go through life absolutely pessimistic and apathetic. You can live like that. I know people that live that way. Or you can, you can go through life full of optimism, optimism, relentlessly optimistic and full of hope. You see, the two, the two choices are is that you can be average, mediocre, normal, common, pedestrian, pre- predictable, complacent, catatonic. You can be like that, like the guy who buries the one talent. Or you can be relentlessly optimistic. You can be enthusiastic, positive, hopeful, energized, excited, purposeful, and determined. Personally, I would rather live that way. Why is it, though, that we fail to be optimistic? What what holds us back? Why is it that we fear opportunities, that we fear taking risk? You know, there's one big reason. It's because you, as a human being, you are a primate. Maybe no one's ever told you that, but it's true, biologically, I think, that we are all primates. And primates operate through fear. Innately, intrinsically, we are born to be afraid. So, for example, if you see a rushing river, you don't dive in. When you see that a fire is hot, you back away. If there's a barking dog, you go the other direction because it might bite your leg off. And, and, and because you took those precautions, you're alive today. If you were not afraid of things, of physical risk, if you didn't back away from cliffs, you'd be dead today. But naturally, you wouldn't be here. But, but naturally, we are afraid, and so we back away. Here's the problem. We just don't operate and live out of fear of physical things. We live out of fear of emotional things. We live out of fear of taking risk of things, of risky endeavors. And some people in life will only see the risk and the risk of failures. You work with those people. And they constantly are putting their finger on the things that might go wrong than the things that might go right. And so I'm going to say this. I'm going to say it twice. Those kinds of people who live and operate out of fear and do work their work out of fear, they risk less so they lose less. But they also gain less because they risk less. Let me say that one more time. They lose less because they risk less, but they also gain less because they risk less. You see, if you don't take the risk, then the possibility of opportunity is just not there. Here's the thing in life. Some opportunities that you take, you will fail at them. That's just how life works. But then here's the exciting possibility, is that some opportunities that you take action on, they actually work out. People who are relentlessly optimistic, their chances of things working out in their favor just go up exponentially because they keep trying one time after another. By, by staying relentlessly optimistic, you dramatically increase your chances of success. If you show me a successful person, I'll, I, I guarantee you, I'll show you someone who has failed more times than you have. But eventually, something worked out because they were relentlessly optimistic. One of those people who I know is Ted Decker. Ted Decker is one of the most maybe well-known, successful Christian fiction writers in the country today. And after he spoke at the Grove a while ago, I had lunch with him. And over lunch, I said, well, Ted, tell me how you got into writing. And, and Ted Decker said, he said, well, I wasn't always a writer. He said, I was a business major in college. But then when I turned 30 years old, I was like, I told my wife, my dream of my entire life is to be a writer. By the way, Ted Decker grew up uh, the son of missionary parents in Papua New Guinea. So at 30 years old, and he said he had been super successful in marketing. He said he quit his marketing job just to write. He said, so he wrote a novel, over a 100,000-word novel. He said he packaged it up, and he went to publisher after publisher. He said he met with 
over 10 different publishers. They all said no. So I said, what did you do next? He said, well, I wrote another novel. I thought maybe it'll be better than the last one. So he wrote a second novel, over 100,000 words. Every publisher said no. He wrote a fourth and a fifth novel, complete novel, first chapter to last chapter, 100,000 words. He said all of those publishers said no, no. He wrote 10 complete novels, he said, and not one publisher would pay him for him. And then he wrote the 11th novel. The 11th novel, a publisher bit. He sold more than a million copies of that first novel. And now he's had bestsellers, Amazon, top New York Times bestsellers, time after time again. Why? Because Ted Decker lives relentlessly optimistic. If you quit after the first no, you don't know what could happen next. If you show me an unsuccessful person, I will show you someone who quit after the first or the second failure. People who are successful, they keep going. They fail more, but they also succeed more. It's, not, it's, it's mainly that they just get back up and keep going. This idea of being relentlessly optimistic, I think it's true for your business, for your work life. It's true for your family. It's true in relationships. It's true in your friendships and in your marriage. It's true in sports. So I don't know if you care much for the Seattle Seahawks, right? But Don Miller, he interviews Pete Carroll, who's a coach of the Seahawks. I know as a Cardinal, we have this deep down disdain and borderline hatred for the Seahawks, but that's okay. Uh, and, and, but Pete Carroll, when I watch Pete Carroll, I can't help but go, man, I like this guy. Because he's always worked up and excited about something. He's always yeah, giving his players high fives jumping on their backs, whatever, getting them all worked up. So Don, one of the professional coaches that Don Miller interviews is Pete Carroll, and, and here's how the conver conversation goes. He says, um, Don says, I couldn't help but ask, Coach, what happens when you lose? So he's talking to, to Coach Carroll. What happens when you lose? Coach leaned back on his, in his couch, and he threw his arms up in the air, and he said, Don, I'm shocked. Every time... I mean, honestly, Don, I never see it coming. And Don Miller says, you're shocked every time, coach? You mean that? He says, every time. He says, I never expect to lose. How do you like that? I want this guy coaching my team. If I'm an athlete, I want to play for this guy because he's relentlessly optimistic. I think nothing will cost you more in your career, in your life, with a predetermined belief that you are going to fail. If you have people on your team around you at work who are constantly believing that you are predetermined to fail as a business, as an organization, those people are poison. You don't need them so much anymore, do you? Because you are a daughter you are a son of the king of kings. Hope is always on your side. You know, the, the sun has risen, and he's filled you with his life. He's filled you with his power. He's filled you with his brilliance. He's filled you with his abilities. So go out and live relentlessly optimistic. All right, would you stand as our band comes on this stage? I, I want to, as they're coming up, I want to sh close with what we've covered today. Here's the, the five qualities we've covered. Christ-driven leaders view themselves as a valuable asset. They see themselves as heroes, not victims. Christ-driven leaders have a bias toward action. They choose clarity, and they stop acting confused. And Christ-driven leaders are relentlessly optimistic. All right. Thank you, church.